I work on climate, <clears throat> deciphering its past, present, and future. I spent a lot of time thinking about how climate change will impact our lands and the lives of our children. I value wild places and love sharing outdoor experiences with my daughter. But based on climate research, I know that her relationship with the outside world will be different. Last year, I was driving two hours one way to teach a course on climate change. During the drive, I was listening to an audiobook about how to tackle the climate crisis, all the while driving a gas-powered vehicle and adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that will remain there for the next few hundred years. The paradox here is obvious. I am contributing to the problem while also trying to solve it through education. You too probably find yourself caught in these situations, wanting to do better, but unsure how to change the system. Our climate is changing. The weather is getting weirder. Will winters keep getting shorter with less snowpack? Will spring storms and rapid snowmelt cause more severe flooding like we saw in Yellowstone? Will wildfire season keep getting longer, diminishing our Grand Mountain views, threatening our homes, and impairing our health? What do these changes mean for outdoor recreation, hunting, tourism, and agriculture? And most of all, what will the climate be like for our kids in 10 or 30 years? I find this simple framework outlined by Dr. Kimberly Nicholas, author of Under Sky We Make, to be quite straightforward. It's warming, it's us, we're sure, it's bad, we can fix it. It's warming. Montana has warmed 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit since 1950. And the warming has sped up over the past 30 years, specifically in winter and spring. One of the most visible manifestations of climate warming in Montana is the rapid melting of the last remaining glaciers in Glacier National Park. Over the past 50 years, there are now 12 more days of severe wildfire weather in southwestern Montana. Drought conditions are intensifying across much of the United States, especially in the West, impacting agriculture and recreation, as well as energy generation and natural ecosystems. Our country is warming, with rates of one and a half to three degrees Fahrenheit per century in the West. And the entire world has been warming up and accelerating since the 1970s. It's us, through the clearing and burning of biomass, production of cement, and the combustion of oil, coal, and natural gas, humans have transferred billions of tons of carbon from the ground to the atmosphere. The rise in atmospheric CO2 has tracked the increase in our emissions of greenhouse gases. As you can see, we are the architects of the changing climate. Here in Montana, we have the highest per capita residential sector energy consumption of any state. And we rank in the 12th in the top states for total energy consumed per person. This is due in part to our extreme summer and winter temperatures and vast driving distances. Montanans are responsible for an outsized individual carbon footprint and thus all share a role in reducing our state's carbon pollution. This decade is critical if we are to meet the world's goal of limiting global temperatures from rising two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Let's do some basic math. Since 1750, humanity has already emitted 2,500 billion tons, that's a gigaton, of carbon dioxide, which is the gray portion of the pie. To have a fair chance, 50% chance of limiting global warming to no more than one and a half degrees Celsius, we have a remaining carbon budget of only 380 gigatons left to emit. That's the orange slice. Although these seem like a lot, at our current rate of emitting 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year, that leaves us only 10 more years of meaningful carbon reductions before we have set Earth's thermostat to one and a half degrees C hotter along with the associated changes that come with that scenario. This is why it's so important that we ramp up our efforts now, as this will give us the best chance at mitigating the severity of the impacts to our wildlife, wildlands, and our way of life. We're sure. 
how do we really know it's human caused? Well, we can measure the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere relative to pre-human influence. We can track our annual carbon emissions and we can fingerprint the fossil fuel sources. The last time carbon dioxide was this high was about 15 million years ago, when temperatures were estimated to be six degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. That's where we're headed. We can directly measure the atmospheric carbon dioxide molecules that are floating around, see where they are originating from. For example, volcanoes versus fossil fuels. As we can see, the isotopic fingerprint of carbon has been progressively decreasing over time, a clear signature of greater fossil fuel derived CO2. The only way to match the observed global temperature increase is by accounting for our emissions while natural solar and volcanic changes show no trend over the 20th century. It's bad. Let's investigate some of the current impacts from climate disruption to the state's most iconic important resources. Snowpack has been declining across most of the Western US over the past 50 years and become more unpredictable. In general, April 1st snow water equivalent in Montana has declined roughly 20% over the last 80 years. And this decline is most pronounced at lower elevation sites. In Montana, drought often means increased fire activity, reduced agricultural yields, and recreational closures, among other impacts. Late season stream flows have been decreasing across the Northern Rockies since the 1950s. And high elevation forests are now burning more than any time in the past 2000 years. It gets worse. Now, we do not have a crystal ball but the next best thing are the sophisticated global climate models that can simulate changes to the Earth's climate based on projected rates of society's greenhouse gas emissions, our land use alterations, along with how the oceans, soils, and forests will sequester or emit carbon as temperatures rise and precipitation patterns change. In 10 years, my daughter, Madrona, will be 20 years old It'll be 2034, four years after the US has pledged to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 52% below 2005 levels, and one year before reaching 100% carbon pollution-free electricity by 2035. Will we have achieved these goals or fallen short? A lot can happen in a decade, and I want to know that I've done all I can for her, her generation, and for my fellow Montanans. Let's briefly review the future climate projections in 2050 year, when my daughter will be nearly my age, assuming we continue business as usual. <clears throat> Here are projected changes for Montana from a compilation of global climate models for two possible futures. Which future do you want to achieve? Diminishing snowpack will shorten the season for skiing and other forms of winter tourism and recreation. Snowboarding is one of my daughter's favorite winter activities, as well as mine. A larger percentage of water will leave high elevations during the winter and early spring, leaving much less water to support stream flow later in the year, during summer and early fall when it's needed most. Changes in stream temperature due to lower flows and rising air temperatures are likely to have catastrophic impacts on some aquatic species, with ripple effects on Montana's important river-based recreation industry. I'd like to make sure that these resources are still abundant and available for our children. By mid-century, the risk of very large fires could increase sixfold across parts of the West, especially in the Northern Great Plains. This has the potential to hinder act outdoor activities, reduce summer tourism, and displace wildlife. We can fix it. So what are we going to do to address the significant impacts that will alter the place we call home? Just like a container ship must begin turning or stopping three to four miles beforehand to avoid a collision, we need to shift away from carbon-based energy as rapidly as possible to not overshoot the two degrees Celsius target. 
And better yet, aim for a one and a half degree world that avoids potential tipping points. Although climate change is a global problem, the impacts are local. We, the people of Montana, can take ownership of protecting our wild lands and way of life by building resilience, reducing our climate pollution, and being clean energy producers. There are a lot of solutions. We know what the problem is, and we have the tools to fix it. Let's look at a few examples of how we can all make a meaningful impact. There are many natural climate solutions right here in our state that can help build resilience. For example, we can increase efforts to better understand and expand how regenerative agriculture can be used to store more carbon in the soil while preserving our ranching lifestyle, grow collaborative efforts to restore headwater streams, store more water for late consistent consistent late season stream flows through beaver mimicry, and enhance ecosystem services, all of which benefit recreation and agriculture. And work with fire by expanding prescribed burns, increase the use of biomass burners for generating power from manure, yard waste, deadwood, as well as learning from indigenous practices like those of the Salish Kootenai and Blackfeet. The state is also uniquely positioned to expand its renewable energy resources and geothermal potential to reduce climate pollution and produce cheaper, cleaner energy. Let's hear how we're doing from someone whose future will be most impacted, my daughter, Madrona. And how our efforts over the next few decades can expand. The Clearwater Wind Project will produce 775 megawatts of electricity, enough to provide clean energy to power about 125,000 customer homes in eastern Montana. We have plenty of wind in Montana. Let's use this natural asset. The development of abundant geothermal resources in southwestern Montana can provide necessary baseload power. Current estimates are still being generated but comparable geothermal projects in neighboring Idaho produce 102 megawatts annually. The new Apex Solar Farm in Dillon will provide carbon-free electricity to 12,000 homes in southwest Montana. There are over 250 sunny days per year in Montana, with above average solar radiation in the southern half of the state. The most effective personal actions that reduce climate pollution are to go flight, car, and meat free. Cars and trucks are most Americans' largest source of climate pollution. Begin with whatever feels the most doable for you. And if you can't totally go without, aim to reduce half your consumption. Consider getting solar panels, heat pumps, and making your home more energy efficient. Reduce your use of everything that heats and cools whenever possible. Move toward a plant-based diet. Grow some food wherever you can. Local is fresher and healthier. By 2030, everyone's individual carbon budget needs to be two and a half tons per year. The average American is about five times that. This requires meeting human needs without producing more climate pollution. Although Montana has been lagging the rest of the country in tackling the climate crisis, it means there is a greater opportunity for us to reduce our climate pollution and leverage the economic opportunities of the clean energy future. There is a lot already that local cities and counties are doing in terms of greenhouse gas pledges and climate action plans. Here are just a few of those that you can join. Climate Smart Missoula, Climate Smart Glacier Country, City of Whitefish, Faith in Climate Action Montana, Montana Moms Clean Air Force, and tribal organizations, or spearhead your own community group. We know the problem is us. The impacts are already here and will continue to worsen under current trajectories, but we can fix it if we are willing to do the individual, community, and statewide work that is required to protect our valuable natural resources and way of life. I hope that you've begun to internalize the urgency of the climate crisis. And once we accept personal responsibility, we can begin to act and influence others around us. To create a societal shift, historical data show that only about 25% of the population are needed 
to drive systemic societal and political change. We are getting closer to that sea change, so now's the time to lead. Everyone has a role to play, and everyone can do more to ensure that my generation has a livable future. We are the only planet with such diversity in life. Let's keep it that way. <laughs>